Hey, what's going on? Got a copy here of the August 1937, uh, I don't even know what to call it, I guess it's a magazine. Uh, I think it's like Pulp Fiction is the technical term for what it is. Regardless, it's an old ass magazine. Got a story from rocket fuel developer John D. Clark, PhD. Uh, just famous chemist, did a little science fiction early on, not many people know about him, his work is pretty much gone, uh, didn't want to lose this, I can't find it on the internet, I had to find this stupid magazine, so I figure maybe there's other people like me looking for it, I know I'm not the world's greatest narrator, but I'm just going to read through it because it's only like five pages, uh, I would type it out, but I feel like that's like blatant copyright infringement. I mean, it's not that old. I have no idea. But yeah, I'll, I'll read it if you like it. You like it. If not, go buy the magazine yourself off eBay. Called Space Blister. You got the title. That That's literally from the magazine. I took a picture of it. We used to think that we knew what space was like. A space, that intangible nothing in which matter floats and whose very existence is caused by the matter within it. And we thought that we knew what the properties of space were, but we know better now. At least we know that we do not know, and that is the first and most important step in all knowledge. On September 15th, 2157, Carter and Pogan Pohl, Jimmy and Mike respectively, the head of the astrophysics department of the Mount McKinley Observatory and his chief assistant were spending the afternoon in the observatory laboratory, pretending to work, but in reality loafing with the finesse that comes only from long practice. They had license to loaf and considerable excuse. Not many months before, they had been out in space driving away the menace of the Minus planet away from Earth and their vacation had not yet officially ended. But the lure of the laboratories had been too strong and they had mutually surprised each other by simultaneously appearing at the observatory airport, each one forced to admit that he had been bored with his vacation and that he preferred to loaf with the tools of the trade around him. Right now, Jimmy was setting up integrals on his huge mechanical integraph and then knocking them down again, when Mike was busily engaged in drawing imaginary and highly improbable animals all over his desk blotter. They had prowled around the buildings and had found all the other men busily at work, so efficiently that their assistance had been rejected with scorn and bad language. Mike squinted one baby blue eye at a particularly outrageous animal which he had just created. Jimmy, he said, this is driving me nuts. If something doesn't happen pretty soon, I'm going to go out and start a war on my own just for the excitement. Jimmy punched a key on the integraph and pressed the starting button. The machine clicked in word and informed him that the integral of e to the x was also e to the x. He unfolded his lanky length, yawned with vigor at the mathematical platitude. I doubt, Mike, that that would be a solution to the problem that is preying on your alleged mind. You would probably land in jail in about 30 microseconds, and some of my best friends have informed me that nothing is more boring than life endurance vile. What do you expect? Do you want to save the world twice a day? Couldn't be as bored in jail as I am now. I... Damn that communicator. It was buzzing and blinking frantically. As his companion leaned over and pressed the answering button, the viewplate lighted up, showing a pallid face surmounted by a shock of bushy black hair. Hello, Carter speaking. The instrument spoke. Hello, Dr. Carter. I'm glad I caught you. I'm Dr. Quintana of the University of Mexico City. I'm up at Wiseman, two or three hundred kilometers northeast of you. Glad to see you again, Doctor. Haven't seen you since that emergency meeting in Washington two years ago. What can I do for you? Will you come up here now? Right away. A terrible accident has happened. What? What do you mean? I started an experiment and it got away from me. I can't stop. If you will come now, please. There was a big crackling sound from the speaker and the plate went blank. Carter vainly attempted to renew the connection, and then turned to his assistant. It appears, Mike, that your wish for excitement will soon be gratified, immediately if not sooner. We'd better be moving. Looks that way, Jimmy. Mike ran his fingers through his flaming hair until he looked like a red-quilled porcupine. Sounds like something serious. Quintana's a damn good man. He is. That work of his on space constants at the last physical society meeting was a good job. If he says it's terrible... He switched the communicator to the hangar, and then the two men headed to the airport. An hour later, they were approaching Wiseman. The little town, long since deserted, lay in the cup of the Endicott Mountains, shadowed from the low sun of the autumn evening. What's Quintana doing in this godforsaken hole anyway, wondered Mike, saying, what's that thing? He appointed to the northern slope of the valley. 
Carter strained his eyes. There was something queer about that little house near the top of the hill, something he could not quite define. It looked distorted, and it was hard to see its real shape. There was a queer iridescent something about it, as though it were inside a soap bubble. I don't know, he answered in a puzzled voice. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. We better take a closer look and see what's the matter with Quintana first. The helicopter screws buzzed, and the plane settled softly to the ground. Yes, there was something over the house, a hemisphere, quite transparent, but greenishly iridescent in the uncertain light. It was perhaps 80 meters in diameter now, and appeared to be growing very slowly. They stopped short before it, hesitant. Wonder if it bites, asked Mike, tossing a stick at it. The stick passed through the iridescent wall as though it was not there. Then he touched gingerly with his extended little finger. Nothing. There, Jimmy. Can't feel a thing. I'm going to take a chance. He took a long, deep breath and stepped through. He grunted and staggered as though he'd been kicked in the stomach and then stopped short with his eyes and mouth popping open. He gulped. For the love of... Jimmy, come on in. Have a look at this. Carter followed him through the impalpable barrier. As he stepped through the iridescent film, he felt a sudden wrench, not quite physical, as though every atom in his anatomy had flopped and turned over simultaneously. Then he, too, stopped and his mouth opened in amazement. The sky was black, the grass was dark violet, and the autumn leaves, which should have been red and yellow, were blue and violet. His hands and Mike's face were blue-green, and the latter's blue shirt was now black, while his orange tie was blue. His own white shirt was still white, but the other's red hair was a stunning emerald green. Mike, he said with his careful calm, am I crazy, or are you? Dunno how you are, Jimmy, but I'm seeing green sunsets and purple poppies. There's something screwy, and that's a cinch. Where's Quintana? Let's find him. Even if the state of affairs isn't dangerous, he'll probably have gone crazy anyway. The two of them broke into a run toward the house, whose color it was impossible to guess, but now it was a strange violet, blue violet. There was no sign of life on the outside, nor did repeated poundings of the locked door produce any results. Carter stepped back a pace, smashed through the door, and saw Quintana still laying face down before the communicator, which was nothing but a mass of fused and smoking wires and tubes. Still alive, remarked Pogan Paul, feeling the pulse, but he's pretty badly burned around the face and hands. We've got to get him to the hospital. See what you can do for him right now, Mike. I'll take a look at what caused this. He stepped into the next room, which had evidently been filled, fitted up to a laboratory. Now it was a smoking ruin with a shattered fragment of electrical apparatus littering the floor. Particles of fused grit glass crunching under his boots and a tangle of twisted aluminum girders fused to copper wires and broken castings in the center of the room lay. He shrugged his shoulders and rejoined Pogan Paul. Nothing but a lot of wreckage, Mike. I'd take a, it'd take a miracle to find out what did all this. Here, you take his feet, I'll take his head. Good, it looks like every piece of the electrical apparatus in place blew up at once violently. Let's get him to the plane for a little first aid. They tramped back across the outrageous landscape towards the wall of the incredible bubble, carrying their unconscious burden between them. The wall was a little farther now than it had been. It was still growing slowly. They slid Quintana into the cabin, and Carter took the controls for takeoff, while Mike broke out the first aid kit and did his best to treat the terrible burns in the victim's face and hands. He made no effort to bring him back to consciousness, judging that it would be a mercy to leave him in a coma. Have you any ideas at all about who started this, Jimmy? He asked as he poured over the tannic acid solution on the burns. Not the Vegas. Carter switched the power from the helicopter to the propulsion propeller and the plane shot forward at an accelerating rate. Your guess is as good as mine. The whole thing doesn't make sense at all, but maybe we can make a sensible guess of what Quintana was up to. He ought to know something when he comes about. Golly, I sure hope he does. If not, we're sunk without a trace. Right-o! <laughs> that damn bubble or blister or whatever it is, is growing, and for all I know, it may cover the whole earth before it quits. Maybe the whole system. Well, I'd sure hate to have to go around all my life looking like you did a few minutes ago. That violet complexion? Agreed. You look like something out of a graveyard yourself. Zombie or something like that. Ugh, said Dr. Mike, and turned back to his patient. Carter turned the plane toward Fairbanks, the nearest large city where there would be adequate hospital and specialists capable of taking care of Quintana's burns, while his companion radioed ahead for an ambulance to meet the plane when it lighted at Iselson Airport. Five hours later, Quintana returned to consciousness. At first he was silent, but as he gazed in bewilderment around the hospital room, his eyes met Carter's, and he seemed to understand the situation. How do you do, Dr. Carter said weakly. Thanks for coming around when I asked you, where am I now, by the way? 
you're in the hospital at Fairbanks, your communicator blew up in your face, and we, Dr. Pogenpaul and I, brought you here. You're rather badly burned, and there's nothing to worry about. I see that there's something else I have to thank you for then, but that is not important. Tell me, did you see what happened at Wiseman? Well, there's a queer sort of bubble around your house, and inside it, all the colors are wrong, and the bubble is growing steadily. Do you know what caused it? Yes, and no. This is what happened. I was on vacation. I go up there every fall during the haunt hunting season. To amuse myself, I've started investigating the old Einstein field theories, connecting all different sorts of fields in space, electrostatic, magnetic, gravitational, and so on. It's an old field theory, but I wasn't so, so sure that it had been completely worked out. I set up my apparatus to try and change the gravitational fields in a small segment of space by the application of various intense magnetic fields and static fields, varying according to the Weierstrass function. You'll find all the details in the notebook in my coat pocket. Anyway, I warmed up the apparatus, closed the switches, and was looking through my observing telescope at the spring balance I was using to measure the gravitational field between the poles of the apparatus, when in reaching for my notebook, I must have closed another switch by mistake, the one that started a simple elliptically varied magnetic field. The machine made a queer grunting noise and the weight of the spring balance sagged way down and then shot up through the top of the apparatus and the tubes began to get red hot. I cut all the switches, of course, but when I did, there was a loud pop and a squeal, and an iridescent bubble about a meter in diameter suddenly appeared around the center of the apparatus, which was getting hotter and hotter all the time. The bubble started to grow too, moving right through the solid parts of the setup as though they hadn't been there. I tried everything I could think of to stop it, and then I recalled that you had discussed some of my work with me and remembered that your post was quite near, but when I called you, evidently everything blew up at once, for the next thing I remember is waking up here. But what did you say about the colors? They're wrong? And how did you say the bubble was growing? Carter explained the situation and Quintana groaned. It has to be stopped some way, gentlemen. If I were not here, he tried to get out of bed, but the physician pushed him back. No, Dr. Quintana, you must stay here for a week at least, so don't excite yourself. I'm sure Dr. Carter and Dr. Poganpol will be able to do anything that has to be done. His voice was soothing, and as the two ph physicists added their reassurances to his, Quintana fell back on the bed. Do you feel as confident as you sound? Mike asked as they rode back to the air airport. No, I don't. Neither did I. If you want the truth, this notebook, he slapped it on his palm, may help some, but right now I haven't the foggiest idea of what this thing is or what to do about it, or whether anything at all can be done about it. Mike added glumly, I'm scared. A bright green with purple spots. Myself, I don't like anything about this business. There isn't anything we can do about it until we know what happened. There's no help for it. We've got to go back there and we've got to do a real investigation. And we'll need a lot of apparatus. That's a, that's a typo, that is not my reading. I'll skip that sentence. So first we'll head for the observatory, get some sleep, and start the job tomorrow. Okay, agreed Dr. Mike, particularly on the sleep question. The trouble with the science business is that it breaks into your rest too much. By the time their heavily loaded plane landed near the bubble the next morning, the bubble had grown until its diameter was almost 1,200 meters. One thing we have to do, Mike, is set one of the assistants in the other plane to measuring the rate of growth of this animal. Then at least we'll know what we're up against, maybe. The landscape was as weird as ever, even more so than before, under the full light of the sun, which appeared to be a brilliant blue-violet. The two scientists and their assistants set themselves to make an infinity of measurements of the natural physical constants inside the bubble. They noticed that as they worked, the sun appeared to be more powerful than usual, and soon started to itch and burn every square centimeter of exposed skin, but were too busy to pay any attention to the phenomenon until they stepped out into the normal world some hours later. Then they knew what the trouble was. Good lord, Jimmy, you look like a broiled lobster. That's the swellest case of sunburn I've ever seen. So that's why I feel like I've been eating crackers in bed. Your case is a honey too. And take a look at the assistance. The sunburn was the most serious that any of them had ever experienced or seen and put most of the crew in the hospital. Carter and Poganpole consigned their doctors to the devil and refused to go to bed. Instead, they smeared themselves liberally with tannic and stuck it out. But the remainder of the work had to be done in the bubble by men wearing light metal helmets with anti-ray eyepieces and wearing opaque clothes and gauntlets. They measured all important constants of space, its curvature, the velocity of light, the mass and charge of the electron and proton, Planck's constant, and all the rest. 
The work was not completed until September 20th, five days after Quintana's accident, and by that time the bubble had grown until it was almost 8 kilometers in diameter. The two physicists returned to their laboratories on Mount McKinley to try to make sense of the figures they had obtained. They were peculiar. The gravitational constant was normal, the electronic charge was normal, as was Planck's constant. The mass of the proton and the electron were as they should be, as was almost everything else, but there was one glaring discrepancy. The velocity of light was not 3 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second, but 2.24 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second, and all secondary constants depending on the velocity of light were altered in the same ratio. Jimmy scratched his more than prominent nose, folded his 6 foot 3 into a hard knot, and grunted. Mike whistled. So that's what so that's what it is, Cuckoo. That's why the colors went all haywire. Yes, that's it. Light travels slower inside the blister than outside it. And the frequency of light waves is of course the same since that depends on the source of light emitted and not on the transmitting medium. So as a result, the wavelength is shorter. Light that would be bright red outside is green or blue inside, and anything that would be green or blue or violet normally shows as just plain ultraviolet. A most unpleasant situation. I'll say it's unpleasant. Mike tenderly rubbed his peeling face. Honest blue or green light changing into UV and burning the hide off me? It almost killed one of the assistants, too. That's what'll happen to everybody if we can't stop this thing. They'll all be either killed by overdoses of sunburn or ultraviolet radiation. Either that, or we'll have to stay underground or indoors whenever the sun is out. That might be possible, but it won't be very fun. They'll die anyway. Figure it out for yourself. It's already killed every insect that entered, entered the blister, and it hasn't helped some of the vegetation. A little UV helps plants and animals both, but you can get an overdose of it. And without some pollinizing insects, not to mention the plants they gotta pollinize, we're all going to starve to death. Juicy prospect. There was a long silence, and then a red-headed physicist asked, Have you a ghost of an idea what it's about? How did it get this way? Well, it seems fairly obvious that space itself is inside the blister. How it got that way? Heaven alone knows and won't tell. The same remark holds for the way it's spreading. What's the final rate, by the way? They just got it figured out about to 19 decimals. The radius of the blister, which is apparently spherical, is increasing at exactly 1.0037 centimeters per second. The rate's quite constant, too, and hasn't varied since the measurement started. That's some comfort. It'll take a long time to cover all of Alaska, and it won't be there in the next couple of days. At least. Mike grinned. Perhaps, then... The gigantic intellect before me will be able to do something about it in time, he remarked. You really ought to do something useful once in a while. Why don't you try it? If you don't do something to live up to all those nice shiny metals they gave you the other day, they may get onto you. There may be something in what the worm says, out of the mouths of babes and so on. What did you do with your metals, by the way? Hawk them and spend the money on beer? No, genius, not on beer. I make the observatory pay for that. I had a better use for it. Maybe I'll introduce you to her someday. I shouldn't recommend it. You know who's the better man around here. But to get down to more mundane topics, give the librarian a buzz and have him send up the latest dozen or so works on tensor analysis, Riemann functions, space constants, and the way the universe is built. You know the stuff I want. Stir yourself, if possible. Possible, but not probable, remarked Mike, strolling over the communicator, just like you're getting a useful idea. When the books arrived, Carter and Pogan Paul arranged them conveniently at hand, slid up the huge inograph, and started work. The machine word and clicked, uncannily solving the equations that were fed into it. For almost 40 hours, until they were drooping with exhaustion, the two men worked pressing buttons, turning dials, making notes, always getting more and more incredible equations out of their mechanical colleague. It was midnight of the 22nd of September when they slid their chairs back from the inograph and reached the last of the black coffee. The machine had answered their questions. Space was not unique. There were an infinite number of possible types of space, each one with its own complete and consistent set of laws. And there we are, Mike. This freak space, let's call it paraspace, for the present as opposed to the ortho space we're used to, it's just like ours except for the velocity of light, which is 0.748 times the velocity of light here. I suppose you noticed that value. Yeah, involves two mathematical, not physical, constants. It's equal to e divided by pi squared. Gotta be mathematical constants, of course, since the physical constants may be different in the different sorts of space. 
obviously, and there seem to be possible types of space with the velocity of light changed by every ratio to every even power from minus infinity to plus infinity. For instance, e divided by pi to the zero power, that's our own ortho space. Or e divided by pi squared, that's this para space. Or e divided by pi to the negative two, or what have you. The limits are e divided by pi to uh, infinity, where light would just have zero velocity, and e divided by pi to negative infinity, where it would have infinite velocity. In that sort of space, by the way, Einstein's laws would just be the same as Newton's, and there wouldn't be any limit to the velocity any body might attain. Amusing, but not very relevant. It's queer, though, that the odd types of space can't exist like e divided by pi to the 1, and e divided by pi to the 3, and so on. If that tin genius of ours hasn't gone nuts, or got a cockroach in his gears, a space of that type would immediately split into two, and the even ones on each side of it and then the more stable of those would eat up the other one. Those stability relations are interesting too. Very. The higher the exponent, the more stable the space. Thus, ortho space, e divided by pi to the zero, is less stable than para space, which is e divided by pi squared. That takes less energy to maintain or form. That's why the para space is eating up our own ortho space, since Quintana's machine went bad and gave it a start, and that's why it'll never stop itself. Hell, that's not the worst of it. Look at equation 96q. Do you get the significance of that? Carter scrabbled through the mass of papers, studied a moment, and then turned white. My lord, Mike, let's get this thing translated into time. He swung around and the integrator again clicked and purred for a moment. And so that's our sentence. He remarked calmly, at 12.02.36 p.m. on October the 5th, the blister will be almost 22,000 meters in diameter and will suddenly change its rate of growth. Instead of growing slowly and steadily as it is now, it will grow at a much greater and ever accelerating rate, so that it won't take more than a week to cover the earth. Instead of taking years to do it, it as it would if it had been stuck to the old rate. It has to be stopped before noon on the 5th then, if it's going to be stopped at all. There was a long silence. Then Mike spoke slowly, as though he were feeling his way through a problem. Here's an idea. It's probably cuckoo, but heaven knows there isn't anything to lose. Why not surround the blister with a bubble of e divided by pi to the negative 2 space? Since its exponent, negative 2, is less than that of ortho space, 0, it should shrink as our space eats it up and confine the blister. It might work. Jimmy stared, his mouth open. Mike, he said solemnly, there are times when I almost think that you're worth the salary they're paying you. That is an idea. But look, negative 2 is less than 0, sure, but it's even farther below plus 2. So why wouldn't the blister eat up the productive bubble of, oh, call it metaspace, as well as our own orthospace? Mike turned and dug, in, dug into the mass of papers like a terrier into a rat hole. Here's why, he said in sudden animation. Look, equation 47G. One sort of space can only change to the next sort of space. It can't skip one. Change from 0 to negative 2 or from 2 to 0, but not from positive 2 to negative 2. It's a sort of metastable state, evidently, and the direct change is impossible. If that doesn't work, I'll eat the 500-inch reflector for breakfast. Right, it will, and now we'll have to do the calculations for the generator for the metaspace. We haven't any time to waste. Ring the stock room and have them send us a flock of caffeine citrate tablets. Black coffee won't be enough to keep us awake while we do this job. And he turned back to the integrator. The task that two men had set before themselves was even more formidable than the one that had confronted them on the initial calculations. The generator had to be designed so that it would form the meta-bubble all at once outside of the para-bubble. It would not do to start with a small bubble because the meta-space was unstable with respect to the ortho-space and would naturally shrink. Therefore, it had to have its maximum size at the moment of its origin, and the power required to form it was in the order of millions and millions of horsepower. That is a nuisance, Mike, Jimmy remarked, after 50 hours of sleepless calculations had shown them the amount of power necessary. There aren't any pieces of apparatus in the world that'll handle that. Who cares, asked the redhead yawning. They'll handle it for a thousandth of, thousandth of a second, maybe, and that's all you need. Let them blow up. We aren't paying for them. Call that design crew and give them our calculations, and then let them sleep. I'm dead. The design crew did their job and for the next 10 days the construction men worked 24 hours a day in and around the blister. The work had to be done. Quintana, now out of the hospital, superintended the construction of the metaspace generator in his old laboratory. 
and his unique knowledge of the phenomena involved was invaluable. Power for the space generator was provided by a bank of atomic energy generators, the like of which had never been seen on Earth, and it taxed the almost infinite resources of the Bureau of Heavy Electrical Industry to provide them in time. The UV light inside the bubble and the first snows of the Alaskan winter were additional difficulties. Many men were badly burned on the deadly job and several died, but the job was done. It had to be done. All of the apparatus had to be run by remote control, and the control cabin was built on the peak of a nearby mountain. Out of danger from the probable explosion, but close enough so that the blister could be observed telescopically. There were the controls of atomic energy generators and of the metaspace generator, which would form the 24 kilometer protective bu bubble around the blister. When it was formed, it would contract gradually until its contraction pressure equaled the expansion pressure of the blister, when the latter would be permanently confined. That is what the scientists hoped for. By 11 a.m. on the 5th of October, the work had been completed. The last workman and bystander had been removed to a safe distance, and the three scientists, Carter, Pogan, Paul, and Quintana, gathered around the control board. Jimmy sat down before the keyboard and pressed the test button. A red light showed on the board. A bell rang. Mike's face went white, and Quintana winced as though he had been struck. That means, Carter said quietly, that the gamma lead to tube 15 is open, and it also means that unless it is repaired in the next hour, we can't form the protective bubble. If it isn't formed by noon, the blister will reach the, the runaway stage. And gentlemen, we shall all be dead. Mike sprang up. You stay here and close the switch at the right time, Jimmy. I'm going to fix that little Oscar somehow. No, expl exclaimed Quintana. That is my responsibility. I am responsible for causing this catastrophe, and I must take the risk of making sure of the cure. Don't go, Dr. Poganpaw. I'll do it myself. You know, of course, that when I close the main switch, the meta generator is almost certain to explode. We couldn't build it to take the load for more than a moment, you know, Carter explained. Yes, I know, but I'm going. I shall try to escape from the danger area, be area before noon, but if I don't, close the switch anyway. The blister must be stopped. He raised his hand in salute and walked steadily out of the door of the cabin to his plane. He stepped in and closed the door. Mike and Jimmy saw the helicopter screws gather speed and the machine rise from the mountain peak. There goes a brave man, Mike. He'll never get out alive. Not a chance in the world. Greater love hath no man. Oh hell. I'm getting sloppy in my old age. Give me a cigarette. The two men sat beside the control board watching the racing clock and gl glancing anxiously toward the north, hoping again to see Quintana's plane returning. But no racing speck showed against the iridescent blister. 11.50 Jimmy swung around and faced the board, his long fingers placed over the keys. Miles away, relays clicked and the atomic energy generators purred and then roared as they warmed up. He touched other keys and more relays clicked as the coordinates of the meta bubble were set up. Then he waited again. Any sign of him yet, Mike? No. Nothing. Five minutes to go. The hands of the chronometer came closer and closer together. Mike shivered and yawned a little. It was a matter of seconds now until the deadline. He started to count aloud. 30, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, mark. Carter pressed the red key in the middle of the board. Relays thudded and transformers hummed. The distant atomic generators grunted under insane overload. Then circuit breakers flashed open, fuses blew like firecrackers, and miles away, at the center of the blister, they saw a blinding white flash. Down, yelled Carter. Open your mouth and plug your ears. They threw themselves to the floor of the control room with their hands over their ears, and then the sound of the explosion arrived. A compression wave in the atmosphere that would have knocked them flat and shattered their eardrums had they not expected it. Groggy and shaken, they came to their feet, staggered toward the hangar where the plane had been protected from the blast. The blister loomed up ahead of them as they headed north, but it did not look the same. Instead of its greenish iridescence, it showed a shimmering pink. The plane came to a sudden stop. The men raced toward the shimmering wall. Inside it, they stopped staring. Metaspace was as peculiar in its properties as paraspace. The sky was orange, the few stems of grass not covered by snow were bright red, and Mike's hair, only reflecting infrared now, was jet black. But they were not interested in the abnormalities of the spectrum. Ten, minute me ten minutes measurements showed that neither the parablister nor the metabubble were moving anymore. They had approached each other to within a few hundred yards, where equilibrium had been established. The danger was over. 
They flew over Quintana's lab- laboratory, passing over the shattered fragments of his plane on the way. The laboratory was a mass of scorched and blistered wreckage. When they traced the gamma lead, they found that it had broken next to the inlet leading to the generator itself. And at the break, there was what had once been a man, shattered, scorched, scarcely recognizable as a human body. But Quintana's charred hands still clasped the cable, holding it in the socket from which it had broken. There had been no way of repairing the break, and he had stood there holding it in position and waiting for the power to go on. How long he had waited, what he had thought of, were questions that would never be answered. Jimmy raised a hand in half salute and then turned and walked back toward the waiting plane. Mike followed. There was nothing more to be said. Yeah, so that was my first time reading that too. So, like I said, sorry for the mistakes and bad narrating there. I, I didn't really make this for other people. It was more like you have this magazine literally crumbling apart in my hands. Um, felt wrong not to save it, you know, have some digital record of its existence before it just like lights on fire every other copy on earth and is lost forever. But I liked it. Pretty uh pretty powerful ending. Good job, John D. Clark. Rest in peace. <laughs>